Hello again, members. Welcome back for another THF conversation. I'm Catherine McNackin, Membership Manager here at the Henry Board, and we have a fantastic program to share with you today. This weekend, we'll be opening a new temporary exhibit in the museum to offer you a glimpse into the process behind each new addition to our collection. Collecting Mobility, New Objects, New Stories is a special look at the vehicles, artifacts, images acquired by the Henry Ford in recent years. And in today's THF conversation, you'll get the first look at this brand new exhibit. And I'm delighted to welcome back our own curator of transportation, Matt Anderson. Matt has always loved things that move from cars to trains to planes, and he loves that he gets to work with all three at the Henry Ford. Matt is excited to give us a preview of our newest exhibit which features some of the latest vehicles and objects added to the Henry Ford's unparalleled mobility collections. Uh, so as always, while you enjoy the program, please submit any questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. We'll get to as many as we can at the end. And of course, to our members, thank you again for your ongoing support of the Henry Ford. We are so grateful that you continue to join us in our commitment to our mission as we activate new programming, new exhibits, and favorite experiences. So now I'll hand it over to Matt to take us inside the exhibit. Thank you, Kat, I appreciate it. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon to talk about the new exhibit. I'm excited to uh, give you a little sneak peek here. Before I do so here, let me get my screen shared here. And hopefully there, everybody should be seeing the uh, title slide. But yes, we're going to talk about Collecting Mobility, New Objects, New Stories, our new limited engagement exhibit, which opens for members tomorrow on October 22nd, and then for the general public on Saturday. And it will stay open through the new year. It closes on January 2nd, 2022. So it'll take us right on up through the uh, the holiday season. But uh, before we begin, I hope you'll, uh, you'll indulge me here. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that today is our institutional birthday. It was uh, 92 years ago today that uh, Henry Ford hosted Thomas Edison here to celebrate Light's Golden Jubilee, which was really sort of a, a two-purpose ceremony. One, to commemorate the 50th anniversary of Edison's invention of the electric light bulb, and two, to officially dedicate the Edison Institute, or what we today call the Henry Ford. So here's that famous painting by Irving Bacon of the ceremony. You see uh, Edison standing there on the rostrum with uh, Edsel Ford in the foreground, Henry Ford there. And then the audience is full of any number of uh, luminaries, if you'll pardon the pun, from uh, the worlds of business, industry, science, technology, you name it. So uh, happy birthday to us. I guess we'll, we'll forego the singing, but we'll at least acknowledge the occasion. Having said that, let's get down to business and talk about collecting mobility. As I said, uh, opens in just, well, tomorrow for members and then Saturday for the general public and will be open through the rest of the year. But uh, we really had two purposes in putting this exhibit together. One, obviously we wanted to share some of the recent acquisitions we brought into our mobility collection. And, and that's uh, recent is anywhere from the past 10 years or so. So things that, uh, largely have not been on exhibit before. A number of them have been shown in our digital collections, but unless you were actively seeking them, you might not have seen them yet or, or realized they were here. But in addition to just showcasing these new things, we also wanted to kind of pull back the curtain on the decision-making process here at the Henry Ford. How is it that curators and archivists and librarians make the decisions about what to bring into the museum collection? Why do we take certain things, not take certain things? Is there a process, which of course there is, and, and what is that process like? So we talk a little bit about all of that and focus on our collecting efforts uh, in, in reasons we collect things, if that makes sense, kind of large ideas or purposes for collecting things. And that's kind of how the exhibit is structured. And that hopefully will all make more sense as we go through the slides here. But we'll just start with uh, literally the opening label there as you walk into the show, because it really sets up what we're trying to do in, in the whole experience. And you know, we, we answer the big question right at the start, what belongs in a museum? And it, it's a question that does not and should not have a simple answer, right? When we collect new items for the Henry Ford, we are primarily guided by the museum's mission statement, which we'll look at in a moment, but also by collections management policies and a collecting plan. 
And the, the short answer to what those mean, our collections management policy defines how we collect things. So that lays out our procedures and processes for evaluating items and approving them and then formally bringing them into our holdings. And our collecting plan defines what we collect. And the, the shorthand way to describe that is it's a sort of wish list for the curators, right? It's things that we would like to collect in the short term. We update it every few years, so it's always fresh and uh, work our way through that list. Now, that's not to say we only collect things that are on the collecting plan. Obviously, opportunities come out of nowhere that we hadn't anticipated. Uh, priorities can change depending on what's happening in the, in the museum or, or the world in general for that matter. So uh, the collecting plan is not uh, set in stone, but it is a formal kind of guideline for us in how we want to develop the collections over the next period of, of a few years. And I just end there with what uh, what should be an obvious point, but but not always, and that when we value objects here at the Henry Ford, we're not talking about their monetary value. We don't value them for their monetary worth. It's irrelevant how much a car might fetch on the auction block. We value these objects for the stories they tell. The, the story, whether it be of the vehicle itself, the people who owned and used the vehicle, maybe the people who designed it or, or even built it, or perhaps all of those stories in some combination. So that's what we really evaluate at the end of the day when we decide whether or not to bring something into the collection. And that again is why we call the exhibit uh, New Objects and New Stories, because we're collecting both of those things when we bring new items into our holdings. And I mentioned the mission statement. Uh, I know you're, all of you are our members, so you may be familiar with the statement, but it bears repeating certainly. And this is, uh, every good museum has a mission statement, right? Just like a lot of for-profit businesses now have mission statements too, but it's the fundamental statement that guides everything your organization does. So at the Henry Ford, it's not just our collecting efforts, but our, our programming efforts, uh, our, our special activities and events that take place out in the village, our uh, publications, anything we do comes back through this mission statement and is filtered through its principles. So I'll just read that briefly here. The Henry Ford provides unique educational experiences based on authentic objects, stories, and lives from Americans' tradition of ingenuity, resourcefulness, and innovation. Our purpose is to inspire people to learn from these traditions to help shape a better future. So it's a, a pithy kind of short statement, but there's a lot packed in there. And obviously you see authentic objects being the core of our, our museum collections and then stories, which we talked about, both of those appear in the mission statement. And then of course, it's not just about collecting these things. There has to be a reason we collect these things. And that of course is to inspire today's audiences, today's visitors, today's researchers from these objects and the stories they tell so that they can use those inspirations to help shape a better future. So we're not just rooted in the past. We always have an eye on what comes next and hoping to use the traditions of the past to inspire the next generation. So let's jump right in and we're gonna talk about the first section in the exhibit. And uh, as I told Kat here, as we were getting ready for the presentation, I, I'm going to share several of the items that are in the exhibit, but I'm not going to share all of them. So there will still be a few surprises for you to see when you come to visit in person. I have also very purposely not included any pictures taken inside the gallery. So there'll still be some mystery about what it actually looks like inside, but I think that's okay. When you do come in though, the first thing you're going to see is that we collect everyday objects. And, and those of you who've been members of the Henry Ford and visiting for years, this will come as no surprise. Certainly you come here, you're going to find some special one-of-a-kind things, some rare treasures, but you're also going to see things like tennis shoes and, and videotapes and uh, tools, right? Things that people use in their everyday lives. And there's kind of a uh, a conundrum in these everyday objects, right? We uh, think about our, our own personal collections, right? We, we all hold on to our wedding dresses or, or maybe the, uh, you know, the special wristwatch or something we might've gotten to commemorate a special occasion, right? We keep those mementos with us throughout our lives, but the items we use every day, whether it's our clothing or, or our tools or some, some kind of knickknack, we tend to use those up and, and then give them away or just toss them out in some cases. So you end up, over a period of time, and, and sometimes faster than you might imagine, objects that were once literally everywhere all of a sudden become exceptionally rare. So it's sort of a fundamental paradox, right? Over time, the everyday becomes rare, and the rare becomes everyday in a sense, because we do hold on to those rare things. And that's something that automobile museums uh, struggle with in particular. You know, if you look at a, a Mecham auction or, or a, a Barrett Jackson auction on TV, you know, you see the the rare one-of-a-kind luxury cars or the high horsepower muscle cars 
always sell for a, a big premium. That's what collectors want. But the kinds of cars we drove every day don't sell very well. In fact, they often don't even show up at the auctions, right? Because people use them up essentially and then throw them out. And uh, you know, no surprise, we collect everyday vehicles at, at the uh, Henry Ford and the Model T being the original example of an everyday uh, ubiquitous vehicle. But more recent examples would be the, the Ford Taurus, if you've seen that in the museum or the, uh, the, the Dodge Caravan Plymouth Voyager we have in our family car section as well. And the picture here is actually from uh, Your Place in Time. This is the uh, sort of communal living space that's created in there. And pretty much everything you're looking at in this picture is an everyday object, right? Or what would have been everyday at the period of the, the late 60s, early 70s that this room roughly represents. So uh, those are the kinds of things that we cherish in addition to the rare and one of a kinds. The first item you're going to see when we talk about collecting the everyday is, is one of my favorite recent acquisitions. This is a uh, Ford Mustang II from 1977, and this is uh, this was the second generation of the Mustang. Uh, of course, Mustang had changed a bit since its introduction in 1964, grew bigger, grew more powerful, really became kind of a muscle car by the late 60s, certainly into the early 70s. And Mustang II represented an effort to kind of reset Mustang back to its original goals. Uh, this was introduced for the 1974 model year, and uh, it was much shorter than the previous model year's Mustang. In fact, it was shorter than the original Mustang of 1964, uh, but it got back to the compact car roots. That was always the idea of a Mustang. It was a compact car that looked cool. And I, I can say this, I think, without risk of offending anyone, but these cars are not particularly popular among Mustang collectors today, right? Everybody either wants the first generation or want, they want those later cars. I know a lot of collectors now are going for the, the people my age, going for the, the Fox body cars, right? Which were popular when we were kids growing up and into our, our high school years. So the Mustang too kind of gets forgotten. And yet it was a, a very good selling car in its time, sold very well. In fact, it was a well-timed car. Uh, Ford, of course, could not have known about the oil crises that would arrive in 1973 when they were designing this car. But this car happened to arrive at the market just before those crises hit in the fall of 73. So it was a, a case of being in, in the right place at the right time with the right product. But uh, despite how well it sold, again, nobody really collects these things, so they become rare. I was also interested in this car as an example of what we sometimes refer to as the malaise era. Car collectors talk about the years from about 1973 to 1983 as being kind of a low point in the American automotive industry. And that was for several reasons, one of which now automakers were struggling to meet new uh, emissions regulations, new safety regulations. So they were kind of having to relearn how to do things. As a result, the cars were becoming less powerful. Uh, the, the fuel economy wasn't all that good on some of these cars because of these new emission restrictions and uh, new things that were added to them and so forth. Uh, and of course, they were also facing increasing competition, particularly from Japanese cars, which were getting better and better all the time. Well, it seemed that there were quality issues with American cars. So I wanted something to represent that malaise era. And uh, the Ford Mustang II, I think, is a perfect example of that. In fact, not only did we get this car, we got a, a lot of the paperwork and documentation, the original bill of sale, some, some repair receipts and so forth from the original owner as well, who kept all of these records meticulously. And they do show that within, I think, two or three weeks after she bought the car, brand new, uh, she had to take it back to the dealer because there were uh, unexplained uh, odors and noises coming from the vehicle. So it lived up to its its reputation as a malaise era vehicle. So there is our, our Mustang too. And on that note, we have another everyday item that is, doesn't seem to be tied to the Mustang at first, but in fact is. This is a postcard showing the Fairlane Inn which uh, for those of you who've been around Dearborn for a long time, you might remember it was uh, not too far from the museum. It was on Michigan Avenue, kind of where the Dearborn Historical Museum campus is today, right there on that corner. And this hotel is where Lee Iacocca met with his top lieutenants to discuss the project that would eventually become the Ford Mustang. Traditionally, the uh, Ford C-suite executives, when they wanted to get off campus and have some kind of a, a meeting, they would go to the Dearborn Inn, right? That's uh, arguably the, the nicest hotel in town, certainly at that time it would have been. Uh, that is exactly why Iacocca didn't go to the Dearborn Inn to talk about the Mustang. He wanted to keep this project under the radar. We have to remember when the Mustang was being talked about in the early 60s, Ford was just coming off of the Edsel disaster. There's no other way to put it, right? They lost $250 million on the Edsel, and obviously the, the line did not take off. 
and, and remains a synonym for failure to this day, which kind of speaks to its legacy. But uh, Iacocca wanted to fly a little lower under the radar, so they went to the Fairlane Inn. And of course, their discussions ultimately led to the Ford Mustang. And uh, I thought it was appropriate that we have some illustration in our collections to show where all of this took place. So uh, found this uh, postcard uh, snooping around on eBay one day where we do end up collecting uh, a number of things that we bring into our collections and thought, you know, we better have that. So we snapped it up. Now we move into our next zone. Another reason we will collect things is to support our programs, right? And when I say programs, I'm speaking very broadly. We're looking here at a photo of uh, Old Car Festival. In fact, this photo was just, just taken last month at Old Car Festival 2021. Uh, one of my colleagues, Goon Wynn from our conservation department is at the tiller of the quadricycle replica. And uh, suffice it to say, we, we have the original quadricycle in our collection, the original car that Henry Ford built in 1896 and drove on June 4th of that year. We would not want to operate that car at Old Car Festival or at any event for that matter for what should be fairly obvious reasons, right? Anytime you run something, there's some degree of damage done to the vehicle and there's always a risk of greater damage. Something could break, something could go wrong. There could be some kind of an accident. And the, the original quadricycle is just too, too precious, too special to risk in that kind of a situation. So in 1963, we acquired this quadricycle replica, which was built by George DeAngelis for what at that time was the 100th anniversary of Henry Ford's birth. And it, it's a, a meticulous recreation. All, all of the details are as accurate as could be. The only major exception is that DeAngelis put a brake on this one, which is good for us driving it through the village. The original quadricycle had no brake. Henry would just kind of drag his foot along the tire. And that was good enough for a vehicle that only went about 10, maybe 15 miles an hour. But uh, for safety's sake, we have the brake. And uh, we can safely operate that replica at Old Car Festival. And of course, we do every year, and it's always a big hit with the crowd. So that is a reason we collect things to support those kinds of programs. And there are other programs too. You know, another example, if you've been in the museum, of course, you've seen the Build a Model T, right? That is a car we collected specifically for that program, knowing that it wasn't going to be stored, it wasn't going to be displayed in an exhibit, it was going to be taken apart and put back together every day. So we're collecting it with the knowledge that parts will break and will have to be replaced over time. And that's okay. So uh, another example of a program we support in our collecting. So the new pieces that are featured here that we've brought in for collections, the first one you'll see here is this uh, Surrey, which is a, a lovely piece. And of course, you visit Greenfield Village in the summertime, you see Surreys like this out at Firestone Farm or at other locations in the village. You will sometimes see them traveling through the village with costumed interpreters riding in them. And uh, we wanted a Surrey that we could put at Firestone Farm for the presenters there to use, either for programming right at the farm or, you know, I could imagine them in the summertime, maybe taking this Surrey to uh, Walnut Grove to watch a baseball game, for example, or something. And uh, this is the kind of Surrey that an upper middle class family like the Firestones could have afforded. We have to remember at the time this was built in the 1890s, uh, the idea of everybody having their own personal buggy was still somewhat unusual. Uh, you know, when, if you had a, a wagon, it was probably a farm wagon, right? And you carry the, the kids and the family in that, you wouldn't bother with a, a wagon specifically for carrying people. Uh, it seemed kind of impractical, but that begins to change uh, in the later part of the 19th century and in a way kind of predates the acceptance of the automobile, which is, you know, they first called them pleasure cars because that was the, the thought behind them. They were coming out of this idea, the same idea as the Surrey, some kind of a recreational vehicle. But what is more interesting about this Surrey is that it was built by the Columbus Buggy Company located in Columbus, Ohio, which was co-founded by a cousin of Harvey Firestone's uh, tire magnate, Harvey Firestone. And in fact, Harvey Firestone worked for the Columbus Buggy Company before he founded his famous tire and rubber company. He was an accountant, uh, worked in various sales offices around the country. Columbus was a big company. They, they said they were one of the largest buggy manufacturers in the world. I don't think they were quite Studebaker big, but they were in, in the higher tier. Unfortunately, like so many buggy manufacturers, uh, Columbus could not respond to the popularity of the automobile. They never found a successful way to stay in business as people started driving cars. Even though Columbus experimented building their own car and tried to sell it, it just didn't take off in the market. So the company closed, I think, about 1912. But uh, this is an excellent piece to use on the Firestone Farm because of that Firestone family connection. And again, it's appropriate to the setting and to the stories we're trying to tell at that location in the village. And not only can it be used for for our interpreter programs, we also have in mind that it's the kind of thing that, uh, say if you're, you're having a wedding in Greenfield Village, you could 
use this surrey in the wedding to take the, the bride to the chapel or, or the groom or whatever it might be, or even just as a backdrop for photographs. So a nice piece to support some of those programs. Another recent acquisition, if you've been to Motor Muster in the last few years, you probably saw this wandering through the village. This is a Lincoln stretch limousine that was made for Pope Paul VI when he visited New York in 1965. Uh, sometimes people will, will confuse this with the, the Kennedy limousine. It's not the Kennedy limousine of roughly the same vintage. The Kennedy car is a 61, but of course that has the permanent roof and is the sort of thing we would never operate under any circumstances. This is a vehicle that is in running condition and we do operate in the village. And again, this was acquired with the idea we could use it for programs like Motor Muster, or we could use it if we had to say very special guests or something around the village. You know, Typically we do that in Model T's right now, uh, but Model T's kind of a tight fit if you have a larger group. Here we've got space for more folks in the back seat. In fact, there are our jump seats that face backwards. You can have a face-to-face -face conversation there if you're sitting in that back seat compartment. Uh, this card's also got an interesting story beyond Pope Paul VI. Uh, after the Pope used it, it was uh, purchased by the city of Chicago, and they used it as a uh, civic parade vehicle. So anytime they had some kind of a ticker tape parade or a VIP or a celebrity visiting town, they would put them in this limousine to parade them uh, down Lakeshore Drive or Michigan Avenue, wherever they might be going. And uh, here's a photo from one of those parades in Chicago. And this is a parade for astronauts of Apollo 13. And uh, you see Jim Lovell, and uh, I think that's Jack Swigert in the back seat with him as well. So I recall Fred Hayes was sick that day, so he wasn't able to, to ride in the parade. But I'm sure probably all of you have, have know the story of Apollo 13, or maybe you've seen the movie with uh, Tom Hanks, but uh, they came very close to disaster on that mission when there was an explosion on an oxygen tank as they were headed toward the moon. They had to abandon their plans to go to the moon and just focus on getting back home safely, which they did. It is undoubtedly one of NASA's finest hours and, and more than worthy of a movie. The movie, I think, does the story justice. But uh, even though, of course, they didn't make it to the moon, the astronauts were treated as heroes when they returned because of the heroic efforts they did. And for that matter, the engineers at NASA here on the ground did to bring them back home safely. So uh, nice to have that photo. And it adds to the story of the car, obviously. Another item which might be a little puzzling when you see it in our supporting programs, but in fact, I think is one of the, the coolest stories in the whole uh, exhibit. This is a locomotive bell. Specifically, it's a bell for our Plymouth gasoline mechanical locomotive. It's the little orange one. So it's Plymouth on the side. You've probably seen it sitting near the turntable if you've been out to the uh, railroad roundhouse in Greenfield Village. Uh, that locomotive came to us in 1979. Before we got it, it had been used at the Mistersky power plant. Uh, now a facility of, of DTE, and it was used to kind of shuttle coal hoppers around the plant after they were delivered by the mainline railroad. And uh, that locomotive uh, it was used a th roughly 50 years, 55 years service. It only had one engineer the whole time it was used, believe it or not. And uh, when he retired, the bell and the whistle from that locomotive were gifted to him as retirement presents. So when we got the locomotive, it came without the bell and without the whistle because those were in the hands of the engineer. Well, fast forward some years, the engineer passed away, his family found these things, and they wanted to re reunite them with the locomotive. So they gave us the bell, they gave us the whistle back, and sure enough, we put them back on the locomotive. And I think there's, yeah, there's the locomotive I'm talking about, the Plymouth. You might recognize it now seeing the photo. Cute little thing, if, uh, if you can say cute about a railroad locomotive. But uh, they wanted those items to be back. So indeed, we put them back on the locomotive. And there's a great story. One of our volunteers out in the roundhouse, as a kid, he spent a lot of time near the Mistersky power plant fishing, I think he said. And uh, you know, he, he would hear the whistle while he was there as a kid. And once we put it back on the locomotive, the first time he heard it, it said it took him right back to being a kid sitting on the river and fishing. So that's nice too, that kind of further proof that no, this is the real thing. This is the actual bell and whistle. So having said that, we removed the bell <laughs> temporarily so we could put it in the exhibit, but fear not, it will go right back on the locomotive after the exhibit closes. Emerging technologies, another main focus of our collecting efforts. And, uh, you know, we, we obviously talk a lot about the past at the Henry Ford, but our, our motto is sort of past forward, right? We're always looking at history as a way to inspire the next generation, as our mission statement says. So we're also always collecting current technologies and what may be game changing future technologies. And uh, this is nothing new here at the Henry Ford. We've been doing it since day one. And this isn't quite day one, but close. This is, uh, of course, 
um, the Sikorsky helicopter with Igor Sikorsky there at the controls, the VS-300A being flown on the front lawn of the museum when he gave, gifted it to us in 1943. Now, this had been built in 1938, so you're thinking of something that's barely five years old, right? Or I think 39, in fact, it went old, so four years old. And uh, that's about as, as current as you, you would want to get. And as it turned out, this is the helicopter that really did change the game for aviation for helicopter efforts. So that's the first successful helicopter flown in the Western Hemisphere. And uh, there had been some successful experiments in Germany, but they used helicopters with two main rotors, kind of on pylons coming off either side of the fuselage, whereas Sikorsky's breakthrough was using the single main rotor with the stabilizing rotor on the tail in the back, which became the standard for most of the helicopters that are still built and flown in the world today. Uh, so that's a perfect example of us collecting a cutting edge technology at the moment. So a nice way to introduce this section. You, of course, won't see it in collecting mobility because it's not a recent acquisition because it's a, a big uh, hot spot in Heroes of the Sky. But you will see something related to aviation. This is a radar scope that was used at, uh, at the Detroit Metro Airport from 1970 to 2001. And you know, we've all probably seen movies with air traffic controllers. We can picture them wearing the headsets kind of leaning over these radar screens as the, uh, the line swoops around and the little blips show them where the various airplanes were. What makes this unit special is it was serial number one of this design, which was the first model that was capable of simultaneously displaying not just the blip, but also an airplane's flight number and its altitude directly on the screen. So you could look at that screen and get all of that vital information right there. Prior to that, uh, air traffic controllers would have to communicate via radio with the pilots. They would radio their flight numbers and they would radio their elevations. And the air traffic controllers would, would write this information with grease pencils on little plastic, they call them shrimp boats, essentially little plastic tags that they would then have to slide around with the blips on the screen and it, it's a bit frightening when you think about it, how much was dependent on the good judgment of, of the uh, air traffic controller to make sure that those shrimp boats remained updated as the planes were traveling. So this took all of that sort of extra work out of, out of the process and uh, suffice it to say was a major innovation in air traffic control. So we are excited to have that on display. Uh, you may have seen this unit featured on a, a segment on our the Henry Ford's Innovation Nation show with Mo Rocca. We will, for what it's worth, be showing that segment in the exhibit. And, and that's something I should mention. We'll have a couple of screens, I think three or four of them scattered around at various places throughout the exhibit, where we're showing videos about these objects. And there's even a video we did on for Innovation Nation about collections management. So it kind of ties to the broader picture of the exhibit. So happy to be able to incorporate those multimedia assets in the exhibit as well. Uh, another mobility story, not automobiles, but of course, we've never been collecting only automobiles. We've collected all forms of overland and, and air, for that matter, mobility. And this is a bicycle. In fact, two bicycles we collected from Ford Motor Company a few years ago. And uh, this was, you know, Ford was never going to go into the bicycle business. This was a design exercise for some of the engineers and designers at Ford, kind of a way for them to stretch their, their creative muscles, if you will. And the idea was to create a bike that could be taken apart, disassembled very quickly, and would fold up and fit neatly into the back of, of say, your, your Ford Focus or your Ford Fusion. Uh, the idea being that, you know, if you were a commuter coming from the suburbs, you could drive maybe to some satellite parking lot out uh, away from the core of the city where your office was. And then you could take the bike out of the trunk, assemble it and bike that proverbial last mile into work. So you get a little exercise, keep some of the traffic out of the city, cut down on pollution, kind of a win-win-win all around. Uh, what's also significant about these bikes is that they are power assist. So this is our first power assist bicycle in the collection. Uh, there's a little electric motor there and a battery pack that fits just ahead of the seat pole. And the idea is there, it gives you a little extra oomph when you're going uphill, for example. And I, I know power assist bikes have kind of gone mainstream in the last few years. Some of you may own them and, and that can make all the difference when you're on a long bike ride to have just a little extra help going uphill. Uh, it's also designed to connect with an iPhone so you can monitor your heart rate and, and the, your distance you traveled. You can even run the GPS system on there to find your way on the bicycle. and. Uh, these aren't just two photos of the same bike. These are in fact two different bikes. The one that you see on the left is a fully functional prototype. The one you see on the, the right is 
believe it or not, really a 3D printed model. It, it's got real tires, real seat on it, but much of the frame is just kind of molded plastic. And, and that allows us to tell another story about the change in rapid prototyping brought on by 3D printing. So that's a nice story we can get out of this bicycle as well. Uh, maybe the most exciting new technology acquisition we've gotten in the exhibit right now is uh, this shuttle you're looking at right now, built by the, the company Navia of uh, France. And this is one of two shuttles that were used at the University of Michigan's North Campus in Ann Arbor as a part of an 18-month research project uh, near the M-City campus. And this is a fully functional, commercially produced product no driver required, though there was a safety conductor on board who could jump in and take over in an emergency if, uh, if she or he had to. But the idea here was to run it on a regular one mile loop around the campus for those 18 months. Uh, it was open to any students, any faculty, any members of the general public for that matter that wanted to ride on this around the North Campus. But they were encouraged to then go online and fill out a survey about their experience. How did they feel riding in this self-driving shuttle? Were they confident? Were they nervous? Did they experience problems on the shuttle? Was it smooth? And uh, all of this data was then gathered and collected and, and assembled into a report by uh, JD Power and Associates about American consumers' acceptance of autonomous vehicles. And uh, you probably many of you know, we acquired the, the GM self-driving car a few years ago. It's, it's right next to the Cadillac. Uh, off the plaza, not far from our cornerstone. But that was a story about technology, right? That was just, uh, I shouldn't say driven, just ridden in, I guess, by GM engineers. Certainly it was fully functional, but it, it wasn't used by the general public. And that was just to help GM work out the bugs of the technology itself to make these self-driving cars work. This is not technology, this is psychology. This is about how do people react to self-driving vehicles. And that's an important part of the equation that sometimes gets overlooked. It's one thing to build a fully functional self-driving car. It's quite another to have enough faith to get in there and ride in a self-driving car, as I think all of us can imagine. So this allows us to get to that story. And I, I was just in the gallery uh, the other day. I was excited. We, we've got this rigged up to the, uh, the wall outlet. So when you come in, it won't be static. You'll actually see the signs and the lights and so forth flashing. You'll see the computer screen inside, which essentially was the control interface for, uh, for the safety conductor. So it, it kind of has some life to it, more so than uh, some vehicles might when they're on static display. Another area we collect is mobility and the community. And, and I very purposely have a photo of Driving America in here. You know, if you know our auto collection, certainly as far back as the automobile in American life, when that exhibit opened in 1987, we have certainly focused on the technology of the automobile, but I think you could argue we place even greater focus on the social impact of the automobile in the United States, right? How did it change our daily lives? Because I don't think there's really any aspect of our daily lives that isn't somehow touched by automobiles or motor vehicles, more broadly speaking. Even if you don't own a car, even if you walk or bike everywhere, you're still impacted by automobiles in terms of the, the traffic, the noise, the pollution, whatever it might be. So we choose to focus on that part of the story, certainly in automobile in American life and also in driving America. So, you know, in this photo, we're talking about the automobile's impact on our diets, our foodways, right? With the rise of first roadside diners like Lammy's there in the background, and then more sophisticated fast food operations like McDonald's, kind of the, the king of them all. And uh, I always like to point out on tours, you know, not only does McDonald's uh, serve customers who are arriving by car, sometimes without even leaving their car in the drive through but, uh, you know, it's no secret McDonald's puts their food together using an assembly line. It's uh, in principle, not all that different from what Henry Ford was doing with the Model T, right? Keeping those patties moving and keeping the burger moving from station to station. So the topping can be assembled and the burger can be put out to the customer. So there's that connection as well. But a couple of interesting community stories that we focus on here in the new exhibit. Uh, this is maybe the most uh, adorable item in the, the collection that we recently acquired. This is a, a sleepy pod pet carrier and a crash test dog, believe it or not. So I, I guess I should back up and say these photos are not to scale with one another. So the, the red sleepy pod container is actually a little larger than the dog. So the dog could fit inside it. But uh, these sleepy pod containers are essentially child safety seats for your pets, right? For a cat, for a dog, or 
small dog. And you'll see the strap there in front of the Sleepy Bot container. Inside the container, of course, it's all padded with plush material, foam uh, to protect in the event of a crash. And then the strap is designed to hook under the seatbelt in your car so you can carry your pet with uh, a degree of safety that's not otherwise possible when, when the dog is just kind of running loose in the car. And they tested these devices using the same machines that uh, are used to test child safety seats. And, and to do so, Sleepy Bod created a couple of crash test pets. So we're looking at Max 2 is his official name there. He represents a little six pound dog, looks like a little Scotty or Scottish Terrier to me. And he survived is not the right word. He endured crashes at speeds up to 30 miles an hour, believe it or not. And uh, we also acquired, not on display, but we also acquired a cat. Uh, Cleo the cat and, and we reason we didn't put that on display is the cat it looks a little strange because instead of a face it has a little GoPro camera and the idea was that they could then study the crash footage from a cat's eye view and uh, if you're curious you can you can go into our digital collections and find a picture of Cleo the cat you can also go on YouTube to Sleepy Pod's channel you can watch that crash footage if you want from a cat's eye view but you know, we certainly gets to the story about improving safety standards in automobiles and automobile accessories. But, you know, the other story we can tell here is how our relationship to our pets has changed. You know, I, I don't think 40, 50 years ago, many people were, say, buying birthday presents or Christmas presents for their pets. But that's not an unusual thing today. And, uh, you know, I, more than one person I've talked to about this is, is referred to uh, to their pet as, as a fur baby. Right. We, we really do treat our pets more as children in a way than, than we did in earlier decades. So we can talk about that change as well with an object like this. Another item on a, a more serious note here is uh, a ventilator. This is one of the ventilators that was built by Ford Motor Company at its Rossonville components plant, uh, not far from Willow Run, uh, coincidentally enough, uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic or the early weeks of the COVID-19 pandemic, I should say. Um, you probably recall that the American auto industry was pressed into service in, in an effort not unlike what they were doing in, in World War II when they were the arsenal of democracy, though this time instead of making weapons of war, obviously they were making medical equipment, making ventilators, making masks, making personal protective equipment, any number of items to help fight the pandemic. And, and you'll recall we were in dire need of ventilators in the early wave of the pandemic when we didn't quite understand how to treat it yet. So Ford produced many of these, many of these over the course of the uh, summer of 2020. Uh, this is the last one to come off the Rossonville line, and it is signed by some of the uh, oh, 1,100 employees who were involved in this effort at Rossonville. So I, I love that they sign it. It's like putting their personal seal of approval on it and connecting their part in this very important story. Uh, and I will note, too, we didn't just collect this one. We also have a, a quote unquote clean version without all the signatures. So it's more representative of what might have gone to to a hospital. I guess I should also point out, too, we didn't take these ventilators from hospitals. It's not as though somebody couldn't get a ventilator because now we have a couple for the collection. For one, we didn't collect these until earlier uh, this year. So uh, and of course, with treatment evolving for COVID, we realized we didn't need ventilators if, if we could treat folks in different ways. So there was less of a demand for them, which in a way kind of parallels what happened at Willow Run when Ford was building those B-24 bombers. Those were kind of medium range bombers designed for the war in Europe. By the time Ford perfected the assembly process at Willow Run, the focus of the war had shifted to the Pacific. So all of a sudden they didn't need the B-24s anymore. So same thing here. By the time they kind of perfect assembly of these ventilators, not such a demand for ventilators anymore, but a, a number of them that Ford made went into a strategic ventilator reserve, we'll call it. So they are available for future emergencies if we need them. But uh, it's an important story. And talking about collecting today, it doesn't get any more today than COVID-19. Another related object to that story, this is a mobile test unit, one of 20 or so that Ford built in April of 2020 uh, for use throughout Michigan. And, and the idea is that uh, you know early in the pandemic, testing was important, right? Do you have COVID? Do you not? Especially for first responders, medical care providers, firefighters, police officers, and so forth. And these folks just did not have the time to go to some central laboratory to get tested every couple of days or whatever might be required. So these vans were designed to bring the test kits to the sites where the first responders were working. They could get the samples collected. The van would then shuttle them back to a lab where they could be processed. Then the results could be returned in as little as 36 hours. So a pretty slick idea. And uh, of course, this is an example, you know, the ventilator was Ford building something it doesn't usually build, 
for the pandemic. This is a, an example of them building something they certainly build, a Ford Transit van, but modifying it for the pandemic. So getting to the same story from a, a somewhat different angle. And what also kind of appeals to me about this, if you look at the window here on the side, you'll see a couple of kind of rubber gloves built into this glass. And again, this was very early in the pandemic when we just didn't quite understand how the virus spread. How do you protect from it? So the, this van is designed to keep the workers inside just about as isolated as possible. There's a little window here where they could you know, put their samples in a test tube, drop it in the window, and then put it through almost like a bank deposit drawer, I guess is the best way I can describe it. So uh, again, reducing the risk of, of transmission of the virus when we again didn't quite understand how, how or where or even when it might, might transmit or the circumstances that would cause transmission. So an important part of the story. Of course, we also collect for exhibits from time to time, right? Especially when we have a major exhibit and you're talking major exhibits, at Henry Ford in 2021, of course, it's driven to win racing in America presented by General Motors. And uh, as all of you know, we've been working on that exhibit for many years and uh, had some things we wanted specifically for that exhibit, which we did in fact collect. We collected several cars, some of which are on view in the exhibit right now, others which aren't on view yet, but will eventually find their way into Driven to Win as we change out some of the loans and refresh over the years. But we're gonna give you a sneak peek at some of those newly acquired cars in our new collecting mobility exhibit. And I'll show you a couple of those new pieces here, not just cars, some other items too. Uh, this is maybe the most exciting item that, uh, that we have if, if you were a big fan of Ford's 1960s efforts. Um, you go into Driven to Win, and of course, we talk all about 1967, when Ford won with the Mark IV with Dan Gurney and A.J. Foyt, which is obviously a, a fantastic part of the story, and, and that fits well with our racing exhibit because that was the all-American victory, right? You had American drivers, you had an American-built car, an American team, so that's kind of racing in America going to, to France, uh, but a lot of the excitement in the last couple of years has been around the 1966 race, which is the first time Ford won at Le Mans. That, of course, was the centerpiece of the Ford versus Ferrari movie, which was such a success in, in 2019. There you had a win with the uh, Mark II GT40, which, uh, strictly speaking, was built in Great Britain, so not an American-built car, unlike the Mark IV, which was built here in, in Southeast Michigan. You also had a couple of Kiwi drivers. You had uh, uh, Chris Amon and Bruce McLaren, who were both from New Zealand. So uh, not to say it isn't a great victory for Ford, but, but technically speaking, not an all-American victory, right? But that's the one that's gotten a lot of attention because of Ford versus Ferrari, and rightfully so. And it will always be the first time Ford won. It is when they got the better of Ferrari. So it's an important story. Also a controversial one because of that one, two, three finish. You've probably all seen the movie. So, you know, Ford wanted to arrange a publicity shot with all three cars crossing the finish line at the same time. Well, that doesn't work at Le Mans where the cars are, are judged not so much by, by speed, but by the distance they travel. How far did they go in that, uh, that 24 hours? And, you know, the cars don't all start lined up bumper to bumper on the front line. They start staggered. So technically if a car is farther back in the grid, it travels a little more distance over that time, right? If, if all three cross the finish line at the same time, the one that was farther back in the starting grid will have technically gone a few yards farther than the winning car. I mean, it, it's an academic distinction, but it, it certainly made all the difference for, for Ken Miles and Denny Holm. They, they, by all rights, probably should have won that race, and they did not because of that controversial decision. But Ford won in any event, whether it was Ken Miles at the wheel or, or Bruce McLaren, Chris Amon. But we are displaying in collecting mobility the trophy from the 1966 24 hour of Le Mans. And this is it right here for, uh, for the most prestigious sports car race in the world. It is maybe somewhat under, underwhelming. It's a, a sort of a pewter pitcher, but I think that's, that's more uh, the Americanness of racing, right? We like our racing loud and gaudy. We like our trophies loud and gaudy. So you'll see these massive things, right? That are bigger than the drivers themselves. The Borg Warner trophy being the, the most famous example. Not that I would call that gaudy or tacky, mind you, but it certainly is larger than life. A little more modest with the trophies in France here in Le Mans. Of course, we have the 1967 trophies on display in Driven to Win with the Mark IV, because of course that's the car that won them, but this is a chance for us to display this and, and talk about that part of the story, give a little more attention to the 1966 race and tie in with Ford versus Ferrari, the film. Another 
story that's tied in with the Ford versus Ferrari movie. If you've seen that, you'll know that one of the characters in there is a fellow called Phil Remington, who uh, was Carol Shelby's right-hand man, chief engineer. I'm so glad he finally got some attention in the movie because his story is an important one, but really was largely unknown except to the big race fans. But here's a photo of the actual Phil Remington. Again, Carol Shelby's uh, chief engineer. So you see the Shelby logo on his shirt. And he was an important part of the effort afford to win at Le Mans and, and all, through all the years that they were competing there in 66 and 67 in the years leading up to it. Uh, after that effort, he went on to work for Dan Gurney at Dan Gurney's All-American Racers out in Southern California. And here's a photo of Remington when we went out to interview Dan Gurney back in 2008, I think it was. And uh, he worked with Gurney for 44 years, which uh, strange as it seems, was you know only not even two thirds of his total racing career. He had a career that lasted closer to 70 years. You know, this was a guy who started right out of high school and worked almost until his, his final day. He, he eventually retired at age 92, I think it was. And, and he's one of those guys that just didn't know how to retire, right? He had to keep working, keep going. And unfortunately, his, his health failed him. He, he had to slow down and uh, sadly passed away not too many years ago. But uh, you see Mr. Remington standing here. You see behind him his workbench, the, the station where he did all of his work for all of his years at, at Gurney's All-American Racers. Uh, the Gurney family and Mr. Remington's family have very kindly donated that workbench and all of its contents to us. And uh, so exciting to have this uh, here. So when you go into collecting mobility, you're literally going to see this bench with the top cabinets, the bottom cabinets, and several of the tools displayed on top of the bench. So it looks as though Mr. Remington has just stepped out for a moment. He's going to come back and, and finish up his work. Uh, one of the pieces that came as a part of this, and, and I don't think you can see it in the photo. I think Mr. Remington is standing right in front of it. But believe me, it, it will be on display on the workbench. And it was on the workbench when this photo was taken. Is this great little wooden toolbox with the, the sliding drawers and, and all of his tools, or well, many of his tools in the little drawers. And uh, Mr. Remington bought this toolbox when he was still in high school in, in the 1930s and used it for the rest of his career. So you know, up to his final days at Dan Gurney's All-American Racers, this little toolbox was still sitting on his desk. I, I love that connection to the very beginning of his career, right through to the very end. So that will be on display. And it's worth noting too, that, that Mr. Remington being a child of the depression, he was a very resourceful guy too. Uh, he, he would, uh, the phrase I would use is he would MacGyver tools sometimes, right? If, if he didn't have the tool he needed, he would just make it from little bits and ends and parts. And uh, he would inevitably he would end up with the perfect tool for whatever the job was at hand. So you will see several tools that he made himself uh, using, for example, parts of, of uh, acetylene tanks. He would take off the top of the tank. It had kind of a rounded edge around the guard that covered the, the valve. And then he could use that as a metal shaping tool, right? And he could like pound steel around it to get just the curve he was looking for. So uh, fascinating stuff and, and a great individual to have represented, obviously, in Driven to Win. And again, ties to Ford at Le Mans. A uh, much newer racer, somebody who's active on the scene today, in fact, is Armani Williams. We see a photo of him today. Uh, he's involved in, in uh, NASCAR's sort of junior league series, for, for lack of a better term, right? NASCAR has its minor leagues, just as baseball does before you get up to the Cup Series, which is the major leagues. And uh, Williams is working toward getting into the, um, the Cup Series, and I, I have no doubt he, he probably will someday. But uh, he is notable not only for being a bright young kid and a great driver, but also being the first driver in any NASCAR series with openly diagnosed autism. And uh, he hasn't let that hold him back in any way from his racing success. And he's also used his racing to kind of champion autism research and autism related causes. And he had a car painted uh, at a race not too many years ago with the puzzle motif that is often used as a symbol for autism and as a logo for autism awareness. And he has very generously donated. Oh, there's, I was just talking about the car. Here you go with the, the puzzle motif there and the, the race for autism, which is, is Armani's own foundation and that wonderful work that he's doing to draw more attention to that, um, that cause. But he's donated one of his driving suits to us, one of his racing suits. So you see it right here, of course, with the his name right there on the belt, but that will be on display in collecting mobility. And, and ultimately, I, I hope it will make its way into uh, Driven to Win. We've got some other things from him too, including a helmet, some accessories and so forth. So in some combination, he will make his way into Driven to Win and, and be featured there as well. And 
another new car that comes right from our collecting plan or our wish list. We had for years wanted a winged sprint car, uh, the World of Outlaws racing series. And uh, at the risk of uh, giving you too much backstory, uh, sprint car racing or, or dirt track racing was very popular in the United States. It's still popular in the United States, but for many years, it was kind of your, your road to the Indianapolis 500 or, or Indy car racing. Sprint cars were open wheel racers. They were running on oval tracks like at the Indianapolis 500. They had their engines up front. They were kind of heavy roadsters like the Indy cars were. Well, all, all of that changed with Jim Clark's victory in 1965 with the Lotus IV, which is the first rear engine car to win at the Indianapolis 500. Now, all of a sudden, drivers at Indy are driving more Formula One inspired cars. And, and those skills from dirt track racing don't translate the way they used to in Indy racing. And as a result of that, sprint car racing in the US has, has a, a tough time. All of a sudden, it, it just becomes less relevant. There's no other way to put it. Uh, it kind of reinvented itself in 1978 with the establishment of the World of Outlaws series. And in fact, that's how they got their name. They weren't officially sanctioned by the, the Indy 500 officials or, or that racing series when they started. So they were there were outlaws working outside the system. So they embraced that and called their series the World of Outlaws. But these cars are, are in, in spirit the same kind of sprint cars that were being raced at, at, at Indy prior to the, the, the Jimmy Clark revolution. But the, the big difference is now they have these giant wings on the top. That's the defining characteristic of a World of Outlaws car. And we desperately wanted to have one of these in the collection and not just any old race car. We wanted one that was driven by Steve Kinzer, who is the king of the outlaws. He's won 20 championships in the World of Outlaws series, starting in 1978 with the very first one. And he only retired, I think, in 2016 or so. And uh, he won something like 577 feature events in World of Outlaws. And, and if you include non-feature races or other races, it's well over 600. So a, a tremendous record by any, any stretch of the imagination and the name in, in World of Outlaws winged sprint car racing. So you're looking at an autograph picture of one of his cars. And lo and behold, we were able to acquire that car, the car that he drove in the 1993 season. And uh, you're looking at it here. It's still got battle scars on it, which we talk about in the exhibit. You'll see some imperfections up here on the, the number the on the 11. There's some marks on the back. We would never repair those or patch them or paint over them. Those are part of the story, right? This was a car that was driven in anger in competition. So it should look a little battle scarred. And uh, this was a, a restoration project that was done for us that uh, all the parts on the car are accurate to that, that early 1990s period. Though, as, uh, as we like to say, not all of the pieces were necessarily on the car at any one time. So it's, uh, you know, normally we like to have all the original pieces from the original car at the original time. But with race cars, it's, it's a little different. Those are cars that get beat up in, in every competition. Parts break, parts get replaced from race to race often. So it's not unusual to find a car that might be almost entirely different apart from the frame from the beginning of the season to the end of the season. So as long as the parts were all period correct and used by Kinzer in that season or, or thereabouts, we were fine having them all together on this car. It's certainly still a complete car accurate for that period and associated again with arguably the greatest uh, World of Outlaws racer we've yet seen. So you will see that it, it will certainly draw your attention with that big wing. That's part of what I love about it. It just kind of screams for attention because it looks so different from anything else we have. Another car that looks different from anything else we have is another one that was on our collecting plan or our, again, our, our wish list, if you will. We wanted a top fuel dragster, right? These are the cars that nowadays they do well over 300 miles an hour in NHRA competition. They are the fastest cars sanctioned for NHR competition. These cars are 30 feet or longer, a tremendous horsepower, some of them well over a thousand horsepower. And again, tremendous speeds. They run on a special nitromethane fuel, top fuel. That's where that comes from. And they put on an incredible spectacle, not only because of the speed, but because of the, you know, the flames that will shoot out of the exhaust. If you've seen the, the Driven to Win movie, I hope you have. You've probably seen uh, Brittany Force in there. She's driving a top fuel dragster. And you get to see the amount of torque on that car when they take off. Uh, from the start line, it, it twists the rubber tire. It literally deforms the tire in shape. There's a great slow motion shot of that happening in the film. But we wanted one of those cars and we wanted one of those cars associated with a champion because we, we like winning cars, right? In, in our collection, they, they're part of the story. We were able to find one that was driven by this man right here, Gary Ormsby, who was the NHRA top fuel champion in 1989. 
And we were able to acquire the car that he drove to this championship in 1989. And then he drove again in the 1990 season. And uh, here's a photo of the car as it looks today. And this is another one, much like the World of Outlaws car that looks unlike anything else in our collection. And, and to give you an idea of the, the scale here, this is 32 feet long. This is the same length as Goldenrod. So tremendous presence on the museum floor. And we're gonna find a way to work this into the Driven to Win exhibit as well after collecting mobility closes. But this will be your first chance to see that top fuel dragster. And uh, as for Mr. Ormsby, it, it's, a, it, it's a sad story. There's no other way to, to put it. Certainly a happy story when he wins the championship in, in 1989 and then continues to race in, in 1990. But the whole time he was doing this, uh, the public didn't know, his fans didn't know because he didn't want to share that information. He had been diagnosed with cancer and uh, sadly he passed away from cancer uh, shortly after the 1990 season in early 1991. So uh, you know, the, the happy thing is he, he achieved his goal, his dream to win a top field championship and was able to do that. But uh, who knows what, what more he might've done had he been given a few more years on this earth. So. Uh, uh, as I say, a happy story with something of a sad ending, but the, the car itself is certainly a celebration of everything that's over the top in American racing, which at the end of the day is what Driven to Win is all about. What makes American racing different than racing in other parts of the world? Well, we love our speed. We love our, our shorter races. We love our larger than life racing heroes. We love the spectacle, right? Racing uh, is about performance. It's performance in terms of horsepower, top speed, driver ability, all of that, but it's also Racing is a performance. We go to the track, we buy our, our, our seats, pay for our tickets because we want to be entertained by these larger than life personalities uh, in these larger than life races. And it doesn't get any larger in drag racing at least than, than top fuel dragsters. So nice to have this one. So with that said, I'm going to uh, stop sharing it here. I'd, I'd love to open it up to some questions and uh, answer them if I can. Well, thank you so much, Matt, for this excellent program. The exhibit is looking great. Um, I definitely can't wait now for our in-person preview tomorrow. Um, I hope our members feel the same. And members, if you haven't yet made your reservation for tomorrow, um, you can still do so at THF.org. Um, so we hope to have you make a reservation and join us for the member preview tomorrow for the exhibit. Uh, now we have a few minutes left for a couple of questions. Uh, some have been submitted, so we'll kind of start with those as more continue to come in. Let's start with one that, um, that looks forward a little bit. Um, Matt, do you have any vehicles on like a wish list uh, for future collecting? Uh, I, th I thought that might come up today. And yes, we, we actually tease that in, in the exhibit. We end with a, a look to the future, something we would like to have. And what I would love to have right now, kind of number one on my wish list, is a Tesla Model S, right? Elon Musk is the one who made electric cars cool again, for lack of a better term. And Tesla ushered them into the mainstream. And, and they seem to be coming more and more mainstream every day. So would love to have one of those. I think it would be a perfect complement to the EV1 or, or, for that matter, the Baker Electrics, the Detroit Electrics we have from the first, first generation of electric vehicles. So that is on my wish list. We'd love to have one if someone's got one with a nice story uh, attached to it. Would look great in our collection. Absolutely. So members, tell your friends <laughs> if, you, if you have one to donate. Um, and that's actually, um, that's a really good kind of segue into our next question um, for, uh, for exhibits that are kind of coming in. Uh, do curators actively seek out new items, kind of like you're talking about, like on your wish list, um, or is there generally more focus on objects that are just offered up to the museum, or is it is it kind of a mix of both? I think the answer is, is yes, generally, and you, you hit it right. It's a little bit of both. We are actively collecting for certain things for the, all the reasons I, I mentioned in the presentation there, you know, for programs, for exhibits, and so forth. But then we also have. Uh, unsolicited is the wrong word, but things that kind of come out of the blue, right? People will call us up and say, you know, I've got such and such, or there's a page on our, our website, which I encourage you to go to if you have something you think might be of interest to us, where, um, you know, sometimes it is something really, really spectacular that, that we don't have, have, that we would love to have in the collection that has a great story and some wonderful things have come to us that way, things we never would have expected or kind of came, as I say, out of the blue. Uh, I will say, and, and, and 
you know, don't, don't be too disappointed, but we often say no more than, than we say yes. And it, generally, we may already have an example of whatever it is the person's offering. I mean, we've been collecting for close to 100 years now, and we have, we like to say, 26 million different items in the collection. So we, we have a duplicate of a lot of things, but uh, and, and sometimes it's, it's the condition or, or maybe the story doesn't fit with, with what we're trying to do. But we're always happy to look at things and evaluate them, and you never know it might work out. And you know, sometimes, too, we can offer suggestions of other museums or other places that might be interested in a particular item. Very cool. Thank you. And actually, as as you kind of touched on some of the different, um, maybe unexpected things uh, that folks offer up for our collections, here's another question um, asking, what's the, the weirdest or wackiest item uh, someone has offered up to the museum? Uh, and did you accept it? Oh, my gosh. Uh, well, you know, we do have some some kind of strange and unusual things in, in our holdings we've collected over the years, certainly. Um, I, the one we always talk about when we do tours and things here, we have uh, the monkey bar, it's affectionately called. And I know this has been shared on the collections blog. You, you can search monkey bar in our digital collections webpage, you'll find it. But this is, is prison art. This is a little diorama that was made by someone in prison. Of course, when you're in prison, you have lots of time, right? So you can do these kinds of things. But it, it's elaborately carved out of peach pits and it's, it's little monkeys in a bar. So not monkey bars like a, a jungle gym, but an actual saloon with little monkeys doing all kinds of things. And it was sent to Henry Ford as a gift. And, and the story is that Ford was so impressed by the, the craftsmanship in this, and it really is a work of art, that he hired the fellow after he got out of, of jail. And this fellow went on to have a successful career at Ford Motor Company. So that one always jumps to mind for sure. Wow. And of course, you know, of course, certainly it was accepted into the collection. Yes, so. yes. That's that's incredible when the object can have a story, of course, and then there's also an interesting story that comes from the process of bringing it into the museum collections. Absolutely. So thank you. Well, I, you know, we're just about at our hour, so I think that's actually all of the uh, the time that we'll have for questions. That'll probably be our last one. Um, but thank you again, of course, to Matt and to everyone joining us for today's member program. We love to share our passion for history and for the Henry Ford with our members. Um, and we're still so grateful that you continue to connect with us here in our virtual programs. And uh, if you enjoyed today's virtual program, please do join us for our next virtual program in November, our virtual holiday lighting ceremony. We'll be welcoming our special guest, Santa, to light our museum holiday tree. Um, so I hope you can all join us over on Facebook Live for that program. And finally, as we wrap up today, thank you again to all of our members for all that you do to support the Henry Ford. Uh, and we'll see you next time.